adopted as God's very own child. Not just when we get to heaven, but as citizens of the kingdom of heaven here still on earth. Psalms 136, if you didn't notice, it was a history lesson telling us all about the things that happened in the, the land of Israel. And the last few verses can even be applied on to now and even on into the future. And we see that each time that something is stated, we see that God's hand is in it whether we think it's good or we think it's bad, God is in control. And He loves us. He loves us without any stipulations. And His love endures forever. 
And I think we need to be reminded of that, especially this week, Valentine's week just passed. But I think we need to be reminded of it all the time because we get caught up in this world and we forget because we can't see God. And we're going to read some passages about that today. We forget that He's right there all the time, every day, living inside of us even, so that we know His love, we can experience His power. We all have sinned. We're God's enemies. We rebelled against Him and we deserve death. But instead of death, He sent His Son to die in our place to give us life. <clears throat> what did we do when that happened? We betrayed Jesus. We mocked Jesus. We spit in His face. We beat Him. And we nailed Him to the cross. And yet God still loved us. And even Jesus reminded God, He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Just contemplate that for just a second. I mean, how could there be that much love except for the fact that God is love and that His love endures forever? What did God do as a result of all of our sin, of us nailing Jesus to the cross? He loved us even that much more. He gave us mercy and grace. But be careful, Satan waters down the definition of love. He says it's that funny feeling we have inside when whoever makes us feel good. And if that's our idea of love, then what happens? Our love grows cold when those feelings aren't there like we want them to be. When it's not our needs being met, we think that maybe we're not loved. And Satan tries to deceive us that way. When things are going bad, he says, does God really love you? How could he love someone like you? And we see it in our relationships with other people. But guess what? God is love. His love endures forever. If you didn't hear it in that passage, His love endures forever. Keep repeating that. Repeat that when you're happy. Repeat that when you're sad. Repeat that when you're downcast. Repeat that when you're mad. God's love endures forever. A young man wrote a letter to a sweetheart for Valentine's Day. He said he loved her so much that he would cross the biggest ocean, climb the highest mountain, and he'd take her out to Valentine's Day if there wasn't too many people at the restaurant. That's our idea of love. We don't want it to cost us something. What did it cost God? It cost Him everything. It cost Him His Son to save us. 1 John 4, verse 8 and verse 16 say that God is love. Not just that God loves, but God is love. Is love God? It can be. Let's look at it this way. Is water wet? Liquid water is always wet, right? But is wet always water? No. But God is always love. Period. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter what you've done, no matter what situation you're in, how dirty you think you are, how messed up you think you are, how unlovable you think you are, God loved you enough that He gave His only Son to save you. A man saw a scorpion in a pail of water. He had compassion on the scorpion. And he reached down and tried to save the scorpion. What did the scorpion do? Tried to sting him, right? It's instinctive of the scorpion. So the man continued to reach down into the water trying to save the scorpion and continually the scorpion tried to sting him. A bystander sat there and noticed this and said, what are you doing? He said, don't you know it's in the nature of the scorpion to sting? He said, yes it is, but it's in my nature to save, to love. And that is God. He is love. Thank goodness we can't change that. No matter how many times we sting Him, no matter how many times we turn our back on Him and betray Him, He loves us unconditionally. And His love endures forever. Thank you. God is love. It is who He is. It's who He always will be. Praise God. Wow. So let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Dear friends, let us love one another. That's what we're supposed to do as a result. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Just the opposite of what we just read in verse 7. Because God is love. That's why we can love one another. That's what makes a difference. That's why we know they're Christians by their love. Verse 9, this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. Not that we might just be saved, but that we might be lived because of our lives, because of a life of love, because of a life of servanthood, a life of compassion, a life of grace. Others will see and know that God is real. 
They will see His love through us. Verse 10, this is love. Now, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. That's the opposite of what we would think naturally. We think it's much easier to love God who we haven't seen because we hear of His attributes, we see His glory in creation, but I can't love Joe down the road because he's just mean and nasty, right? It, this is the opposite of what we think. But the Bible verse here says that how can we love God if we can't love our neighbor who we have seen? How can we not have compassion and caring for our neighbor who we do see and know? And even more for the reasons in his life that makes him mean and nasty. Maybe he hasn't had things as good as you. Maybe he didn't have anybody on Valentine's Day tell him how much that they loved him. Maybe he needs to love, learn the love of God so desperately and he needs to see it through the living word of God, you, in your testimony, in your life, in your love. <clears throat> Verse 13, this is how we know that we live in him and he lives in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has seen His Son to be, has sent His Son to be Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. If you didn't get it the first time, here it is the second time. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on that day of judgment in this world we are like Jesus now that's verse kind of puts it clear doesn't it if we're not loving which he's already said before then are we in God are we in his will are we doing what he pleases or is does God abide in us because if God abides in us we will love and the fact that we love one another we can have confidence on the day of judgment that God resides in us through His Spirit, that we are sealed by the Spirit for all eternity. And we don't have to have any fear on that day of judgment because we've been saved because of what Jesus did, His righteousness. Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love. So you don't have to fear that day whatsoever. You don't have to doubt. But the complete opposite of fear, perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And guess what? We won't be punished as children of God. We may disappoint God. We may hurt God. We may fail God. But He still loves us unconditionally. He loves each and every one of His children. Enough that He would sacrifice His only Son to save us. And we are to share that love with one another. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So I ask you today, is this how you live? Is this how you love? There's three things there that you should have seen from that passage. Number one, God is love and He loved us. Number two, that we're to love God. And number three, we kind of forget this one sometimes. That means we're supposed to love one another. Even those who seem unlovable. Even those who hurt us and betray us. Jesus said, if your cheek gets slapped, turn the other cheek, right? That's what he teaches. That's a hard and offensive teaching to us unless we understand how much God loves us and how much mercy he gave us and how much grace he gave us and that Jesus died for every one. <clears throat> so Thursday was, I mean Tuesday was Valentine's Day. We had a love feast, right? Hopefully many of you got to come. If you didn't get to come, maybe we'll have another one sometime. There is a reason why Sherry and I like to serve then at Valentine's Day. We love to serve you guys anyway. But Valentine's Day is a day that wasn't one of our best days. It's a day that I did something I should have never, ever done. 
I gave her orange roses instead of red roses one Valentine's Day. I gave her a dozen of them. You're like, what? But she had back problems with her discs and stuff, and she was on medication and stuff, and her mother was instigating in our lives, saying that, you know, all you need to do is divorce him and get rid of him instead of being the mother that she needed to be and, and telling, him, telling her to support him and everything. And the straw that broke the camel's back was that I gave her orange roses instead of red roses. Now, we've got past all that, but we like to serve others. And I've done plenty of things that she's forgiven me of. But we like to serve others on Valentine's Day because when we sit down with each other, we don't think back about that. We hold no, no grudges about that or anything else. But we like to take the things that have happened in our lives and use them as a testimony for God. That's one of the reasons that we got called into the youth ministry at first. Was it that I had a desire to, to be with high school kids? Not in the least. <laughs> But God said, you know, you've had some experiences and stuff here and I want you to share them. And the two of you can share your different experiences and you can be open and honest with these kids and teach them about love, acceptance. Because they're a group, especially in this world, that feels alienated from this world, that feels like nobody does love them. And they're searching for that love. And we need to show it to them. <clears throat> so we had a wonderful love feast. The Greek word used in John, 1 John 4 is agape. You should be familiar with that. It is a noun. It means affection. It means goodwill, love, charity, benevolence, brotherly love, and even love feast. That's one of the definitions. It's an unconditional love. It's not because you guys did anything that we wanted to give you this meal and pour out our love on you. It's because we want to love one another because God first loved us. And we want to show you how much we care about you and that you're our family that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. The verb version of agape is agapo, I try to say it right, agupao, instead of agape. Matthew 5, verses 43 through 46 says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hurt your, hate your enemy. Not hurt him. <laughs> but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? John 3.16 uses the same word for love. Imagine that, that, that Matthew uses for loving your enemies that Jesus quoted. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The kind of love that God had for us is the same kind of love that we're supposed to have for one another. We are his children. We are to agupeu as God agupe us, because God is agape. John 15 uses both the nouns and the verbs to show exactly what it means to love and how we're loved. In John 15, verses 9 through 17, As the Father has loved, the verb form, me, so have I loved you, the verb. Now remain in my love, the noun. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, the noun. Just as I have kept my Father's command and remain in his love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's own friends, just as Jesus did. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love one another. Love brings about lasting relationships. It draws people to Christ so that they may know God as their Father. God is love. His love endures forever. And His love is made complete in Jesus and lives through us. So let's read 1 John 4 again. 
Starting in verse 7, it says, Dear friends, that's us. That's the ones beloved by God, the children of God. Let us love one another. This is what we're to do. For love comes from God. Everyone who has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. He doesn't change. It's unconditional. It's for you and for me and for everyone else. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. And we just read in the previous passage in John that we're supposed to have the same kind of love for one another, even to the point of laying down our life for a friend. Verse 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, we see it repeated again. Are you listening, children of God, brethren, dearly beloved, those loved enough by God that He would sacrifice His Son for you? Since God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we do love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. And we just read that from the previous verse about being complete in Christ. Not that we're made perfect, we'll still sin and everything, but that we understand God's love through Jesus Christ, that we are to love one another. Because God had compassion and loved us as we were sinners and enemies of God. Verse 13, this is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us. So that we have confidence on that day of judgment in this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. You're the complete opposite. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And He has given us this command, not this suggestion. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You guys might have wondered why I had the other husband serve the wives and couples so that we could learn what it is like to serve one another and love each other. So Mark and Debbie were together, sitting at a table with Mark and Diana, for example. So Mark had to get up repeatedly, because he was serving Debbie, because Debbie wanted extra fried cheese, extra desserts. You see how that works? And so he had to serve her out of a loving heart. And he had to present the gifts that Barry was giving his wife. He had to present them. So we all just came together, and I think it worked well, we came together in a love feast, in a love relationship. Maybe we got a little glimpse of what heaven is like because he says he's prepared a feast for us, right? That we're going to celebrate. And I think we had a good time then. So if you missed out, maybe next year. So the title of this sermon is What Lasts? What does last? Love. 1 Corinthians, we need to look there because that's the love chapter, right? That's how you should love your spouse, right? No. That's how you should love your church friends and those outside of the church. 1 Corinthians 13 has nothing to do with your mate. So let's start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ. See, I told you. He's talking to the church. And each one of you has a part in it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of, of helping, of guidance, of different kind of tongues... But are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all, gifts have, all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. But what is the greater gifts? Well, if we read on, we're going to find that out, right? And I've already given you a hint. His love endures forever, right? What lasts? What's permanent? Love. Okay? So if we go on to chapter 13 and keep reading... If I speak in the tongue of men's or angels, but do not have love, 
agape love, the kind of love that God had for us, for God so loved the world, and the kind of love that I'm supposed to have for my brother or sister, even my enemy. I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. I'm just noise. Just noise. Who cares to hear just noise? It serves no purpose. Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith and can, that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Not, I'm okay, I've got this down pat. But we look towards those people, and that's what the Corinthians were doing, is they said, whoa, that, that guy has this gift of prophecy, and this has tongues, I want to be like them. And Paul's saying, desire to love one another. That's what matters. Verse 3, if I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I might boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. First time it said I am nothing. Second time it says I gain nothing. And we're supposed to build up treasures not here on earth, but treasures in heaven. But I'm gaining nothing, right? I have no accomplishments, no rewards. Verse 4, let me explain what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love does, is not proud. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but love does rejoice in the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Now, this is a great passage to read in your relationships with your spouse, with your children, with everything else, because one of them is going to slap you right in the face if four or five of them don't, right? That's what love is. It's not that funny feeling that we get. It is a decision that we make and cannot make unless we know God because God is love. And if we've decided to accept His love through Jesus Christ, that it only comes naturally and it is our commandment and it is His will and, and perfect will that we love one another. Not just our spouse, not just our friends, not just those that are family and church, but everyone. Because we should see through Christ's eyes the love that He had, that He went through all the pain and persecution and betrayal and everything else because of His love to save us. We should have that same desire. Because if we don't tell others about Jesus Christ, then they might not know about Jesus Christ. It is our responsibility. And yes, we can sit there and say, oh, someone else might do it if we don't. Surely God will take care of that. But He's called each and every one of us to do it. And you won't have those treasures built up in heaven. And you'll be being disobedient to the Father and not being in His will. You'll miss out on so many blessings. Paul tells us the importance of love compared to these other gifts. These gifts that are given by the Spirit. These gifts that are given to propel the ministry, to propel the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he says, if you don't have love, it doesn't matter about any of these other gifts. If you don't have the motive figured out behind this, you're not doing anything. God is love and He's called His children to love. So Paul says to seek the gifts that last, those things that are eternal. So he goes on and says, <clears throat> and remember what he did say in chapter 12, he says, Now eagerly desire the greatest gifts, the ones that last, the ones that endure. So in verse 8 of chapter 13, he tells us, Love never fails. Doesn't mean that you're not going to fail at love and you're not going to make mistakes. Oh, you're going to do that plenty. You're going to do that probably daily. What he means is that it lasts. It's permanent. It's the thing that makes the differences. It's the reason that God sent His Son because of love. It is what God is and He does not change. It will never end. It will never fail or falter but instead endures forever. His love endures forever. The psalmist wrote that, and you'll find it, like I said, 44 different times in the Old Testament in prayers and in songs. Probably one of the most important songs that they sang so that they would remember and not forget all the things that the Lord had done for them. And He did it because He is love and He loves them. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. All these other gifts that he just mentioned that says if you don't have love, these gifts are nothing. He says not only 
Are these gifts nothing without love? But these gifts will end. There will come a time when we spend eternity in heaven. And there will be no need for these gifts anymore. We won't need to prophesy about the truth. We'll be living in the truth. We won't need to speak in tongues so that other people can understand because we'll all understand and know and everything will be perfect. These are gifts that are needed here on earth, but they mean nothing if you don't have the love to back them up. Verse 9, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked as a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the ways of, my, uh, ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. For now, in this life, things are incomplete. We need to testify and we need to use all the gifts of the Spirit. But we need to understand the motivation behind it, that God is love and His love endures forever. We are His children. We are His hands and feet. We are the salt that gives flavor to this earth and the light that draws them out of the darkness. Then when completion comes, we will live together for all eternity. Not in a foreign world anymore, but in a world in heaven where Jesus has prepared for us. All things will be complete. Verse 13 is the last of that chapter and says, And now, and you can look at many different commentaries and they'll say many different things, but here is my version on this. Paul is coming to a conclusion. And now I'm coming to a conclusion. Because I don't believe that means now in this lifetime. But other commentators will tell you that. Now, Paul is coming to a con conclusion of what he's saying. These three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. You see, without faith, we never believed in the first place. Faith is trust in God. Believing what we cannot see. Believing that God's love does endure forever. So that we have hope. Not hope as mankind defines hope, but hope that without a doubt, that we know with complete certainty that we have nothing to fear on that day of judgment, that we will spend eternity with God, our Father, in heaven. And it's all because of love. And then he goes on to say, but the greatest, so the complete opposing fact, three things are, are, are lasting, but the greatest of these three is love. Why will love last and endure forever? Because God is love, and He's called His children to love through the power of Jesus Christ that He has placed in each and every believer through the power of His Spirit. Praise God. But Satan wants to deceive us. He doesn't want us to believe this. He wants to tear our relationship down. He wants to tell us we're not worthy, that we can't do it when we have the power of God living inside of us. When this is God's perfect will that we love one another. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's from Psalms 118. Romans 8, 37 and 39 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is that is in us through Christ Jesus our Lord. So many people will quote that verse and say it so many ways, but what it's saying here is that God loved us and nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from that love. We are His children. By faith we have hope and we are called to be united in love because God first loved us. <clears throat> Jeremiah says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. The Old Testament says it over and over again. We saw it 26 times in that psalm. It's a constant. It is everlasting. It will not falter. It will not cease. It will not even decrease. As we do more and more things that should take us away from the love of God, what does He do? He pours out more and more mercy and grace and love. He loves His children with an unconditional love unfailing love. Wow. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. 
1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the spirits, especially prophecy even. But as we learn from 1 Corinthians 13, that if we don't have love, we're not getting the picture of it, are we? That we're to serve one another, to love one another, even our enemies. One Valentine's Day, a little boy was preparing his Valentines for his classmates. Y'all remember that? I know I did when I was back in elementary school. I was in Miss Ashley's class in first grade. And I had a little sweetheart. Maybe she'll hear this one day online. Her name was Beth Gay. And of course I wanted to give her a Valentine's. But see, we gave Valentine's to everybody in the class. I don't know if that's what you did or not. Your mom went and got the box of Valentine's Days. Probably in that day they were Snoopy Valentine's and stuff like that. Or you made your own. The girls were more creative and made their own, but guys didn't. But guys even gave, because we had that childlike love, guys even gave other guys Valentine's. We weren't too good for that. You might just sign it, Alan, or whatever. You know, you didn't put love necessarily. But you had a little name up there with all the bags, and you put your valentines in each one. You didn't leave anybody out. That's the perfect example of what our love should be like. We don't leave anyone out. We have that childlike love. Well, there was this one time when mom, she has her knowledge, and it's not that childlike knowledge. She knew that her little boy was not the most popular in class, and she dreaded Valentine's Day. Because her son was going to go and he wasn't going to get as many valentines as others. She walked, watched him walk home from school and he always walked behind the other kids that were talking and playing. So she dreaded that day. So she sent him off to school with all of his valentines. They had prepared them and everything. And she was preparing for the worst when he came home. She had fixed him his favorite dessert and everything was ready to give him sympathy and love that only a mom can. And she sees him walking up the road and he is walking behind the others. All of them seem to have a little skip because today they got Valentine's Day, right? Today's a good day. So he came in the house and he went right by and she says, Don't you want to eat something? I prepared this for you. He said, No, no, I, I don't want to eat anything. And he just went mumbling off to his room, not one, not one. So she just knew he didn't get one Valentine that day. So she went to his room, knocked on his door, and instead of him crying, he was sitting there praying. And he said, not one, Father, not one. I didn't miss giving one a Valentine's Day today, telling them how much that I love them. Not one. That's the kind of love that we should have, that we eagerly desire to tell one another, to serve one another, to tell them how much we love them because God first loved us. Wow. What lasts? What never ceases? What can mend all things? What is the greatest? Love. And it's what we're supposed to practice as children of God. Father, we thank you so much for the love that you gave us. That you would send your son to die for us even when we betrayed you, him and you, Lord. When we didn't want any part of that. We wanted a God that would just fix our needs and do things for us. Lord, help us to love you and serve you. To understand the love that you have so that we pour out love on others. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the love that is in this church, the unity of the Spirit that we have, that we are one accord and that we do love one another. And Father, I pray that we practice that love more and more and we reach out more and more to our community and love one another. That this will not be a place, that Bonners Ferry will not be a place where people don't see that we reached out to not one, but that we reached out to everyone in love of Christ. We just thank you and praise you for your love that you never change, that your ways are perfect. And we thank you for loving us enough that you would save us through the blood of the Lamb. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to close with a song. So I'm going to close. It's one that Jacob and Sherry and Emily were going to do. You didn't know about it because we just picked it the other day.